Hey, Matthew, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Josh. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, let me introduce us. I am Josh Summers. I'm a yoga teacher and licensed acupuncturist, and this is Meaning of Life TV. You are Matthew Remsky, a yoga teacher as well, um, also an industry consultant in the yoga industry, and an author of several books. Most recently, you've written a book about problematic group dynamics in the yoga world, and it's called Practice All in All is Coming, Abuse, Cult Dynamics, and Healing and Healing in Yoga um, and Beyond. Um, so I should say, you know, it's, it's really nice to meet you. Um, this is kind of an odd uh, sort of endorsement to you, but uh, right at this point, I'd say you're the, you're the main reason I go on to Facebook. <laughs> So, oh, as, wow. as, that's, that's that's mixed i i i am i'm happy to hear that i'm sorry to hear that all at the same time no no i mean I, for me it's positive because the, okay. there isn't that much uh worth following on facebook but um i came across your work maybe two or three years ago um someone shared something you had blogged about about abuse and uh some of these problematic dynamics in the yoga world and i just kind of got got into following what you had to say about it. And it really seemed like you had some trenchant analysis that was deeply missing in the the broader conversation. So I want to dive into that, talk about what's going wrong, what's going on in yoga land, uh, what's problematic about it, and what might be uh, some ways that things can be remedied. Um, But as a way of introduction, uh, you or yourself are a survivor of two cults. Um, and I know that part of this work in this book has been a, a bit of a healing journey for you. But how did you come to a focus on the Yashtanga yoga situation uh, particular and what was going on in that that you felt needed to be highlighted? Well, I came to it reluctantly. Um, the project that I had started with was a broader research project into injuries in yoga classes or in yoga practice. And um, the format was quite broad. Uh, I had started interviewing people from all communities and methods. uh, And, you know, it had started with the strange realization that um, everybody that I knew who had professionalized into the yoga world or who was a really dedicated student was injured in some way. Uh, uh, you know, they were suffering, people were suffering from chronic pain or from repetitive stress injuries. Uh, and I found that very weird for um, a so-called therapeutic practice that people came to for spiritual benefit, but they also seemed to be working themselves really hard in. And I, I started to wonder about that. Um, the book that started to emerge out of that research project was originally called uh, Shadow Code. And the project name was, what are we actually doing in in asana? And I still have shadow pose as kind of like a book structure. Mm -hmm. uh, But first chapter was going to be um, an examination of interview data of senior students of Mr. Iyengar. uh, And the second chapter would be... uh, a series of, or an analysis of interview data uh, coming from the Ashtanga world. And at a certain point, I realized that the injury question in the Ashtanga world, which is profound, it's, it goes deep, um, was, I think, uh, it, it was still a surface question to the abuse issue that had been silent for many, many years, but also carried by a number of women survivors in a kind of whisper network as well. So uh, once I started getting more and more attuned to the fact that that was an underlying story, that that, uh, Mr. Joyce had actually assaulted women throughout his career, uh, and nobody had really published on it, I, I realized that, you know, I couldn't just put that into a chapter somehow, that there was going to be... Um, there was going to be a lot of there was going to be a lot of um, more work to do on that, and so uh, I also didn't, you know, when I started to um, get a sense of how grave the issue was, I um, really resisted going into it because I thought that, you know, my my gut was that if it really was true that Patabi Joyce was a serial sex abuser, 
uh, and that he did it in broad daylight and that there were an untold number of women victims and that none of them had been able really to speak out publicly about it until Annika Lucas in 2010 and that um, the community had not done anything about it and it was probably widely known within the upper echelons of the Ashtanga world uh, even into even as early as 2012 but of course we now know it was far earlier than that but in 2012 there was you know, a big hagiography hey published of Joyce's life, mm -hmm. featuring, featuring, featuring interviews with 40 students, and everybody talked about how wonderful he was and what a, you know, grandfather and father figure he was and a spiritual teacher and all of that. Uh, and it, so I had this sense around 2015 or 16 that, you know, if, if what, what I was hearing was true and I believed that it was true, uh, that it would really rock the foundations of this particular community. Mm -hmm. And I was scared of that. Um, and I also thought that it would rock the foundations of the broader yoga world because Joyce is incredibly influential. Uh, without him, you know, there's no vinyasa. Without him, there's no... Um, sense of the contemporary group yoga class as being a, an intense, ecstatic, immersive, silent experience filled with breath and sweat. Mm. Without him, there's no adjustment protocol. Um, and not that it, he really gave a protocol. He, he assaulted people. But, but the whole notion that the, the teacher should always have their hands or should have their hands on a student at all times, that comes from his particular uh, pedagogy. And, and so I, I, I just was terrified of the implications of what I was hearing, and I, I resisted it for a long time, actually. Yeah. Um, some of our audience is definitely going to be familiar with the names and terms of, that you just mentioned, but there's, a, there's probably a, a, a yogic, unliterate audience or a, right. that is listening too. So can you put Ashtanga on the map and then put Patavi Joyce's relationship to Ashtanga on the map in that? Yeah. So Patavi Joyce is the innovator of a system that he named as Ashtanga Yoga, but it's unclear when that name came into usage because um, of it seems that he was calling his classes that he gave to, um, you know, the, the businessmen of Mysore up until the end of the 60s, just yoga. Uh, he had been trained in the Mysore Yoga Shala uh, at, uh, at a very crucial point in the development of modern yoga history. Uh, he was born in 1915. He met... Um, the person who many consider to be the father of modern yoga, Tirumalai Krishnamacharya, uh, when he was about 12 years old. Uh, and he actually describes being brutalized by Krishnamacharya, being beaten as he learned to do asanas. Of course, he's not describing that in terms of abuse, but rather as a badge of, of kind of honor. Um, and uh, he goes on to further his studies uh, later on in his life um, with Mr. Krishnamacharya and uh, assumed a teaching position at the Mysore Yoga Shala sometime in the late 30s. Um, but also under Krishnamacharya's tutelage was his uh, son-in-law, or sorry, his brother-in-law, BKS Iyengar. And um, so from this one gym, uh, which was set up by the Maharaja of Wadyor uh, in 1934, um, we have two of the pillars of the modern yoga evangelical movement. Um, Iyengar is responsible for the notion that uh, bodily postures that we assume in yoga, that we take on in yoga, should express some sort of geometrical form and balance and symmetry and a kind of like architecture of grace. Uh, but Joyce is the person who uh, puts postures into rigorous sequences and really gives the modern group class its fluid and intense feeling uh, going forward. Um, and, he, and, and, the, and the Ashtanga Joyce form has spawned into numerous side forms, right? Right, right. So if you've been to a, if 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 you're if you're new to all of this jargon, uh, you've been to and you've been to a flow class, um, you are. Um, you are benefiting from and, and perhaps being injured by uh, Joyce's legacy. Uh, if you've been to a vinyasa class, you are probably um, benefiting from uh, Joyce's legacy. If you've been in a class where rhythmic breathing has been timed with movement in some sort of coordinated way, that's all coming from Joyce. And also I'd say that, that it's Joyce's senior students um, coming out of his tutelage 
uh, from the late 60s, uh, but then especially into the 80s, that really give modern yoga its aesthetic in terms of its incredible athleticism, its, you know, beautiful but sometimes scary contortionism. Um, you know, when you look on Instagram today at hashtag yoga, um, you will see images that really had their birthplace uh, in terms of their sensuality, their their structure, their um, the, the whole aesthetic uh, really comes out of the Joyce movement. It's not Iyengar yoga photographs that get the most clicks on on Instagram. It's really the beauty and the artistry, and I would say the sensuality and the sublimated sexuality of, um, and sometimes not sublimated sexuality of. Uh, the that imagery that is directly coming from Joyce, and I think there's a there's something in there too around the connection between the yoga posture and um, and a kind of sexualized performance. I mean, objectification aside, uh, and all of the sort of image issues aside, I think the fact that um, many of Joyce's female students were learning in an environment in which he sexually objectified them. That's really that's really pertinent. So when we when we go to Instagram and we look at yoga images right now, we're looking at uh, at least part of a legacy of um, people being um, really having to perform under the male gaze in more ways than one. So talk about that the the, the sexual objectification. Right. With well, Joyce. And then and then and how did that lead to abuse, both physical and sexual, under his, under him in his classes? And, what, and, yeah. what, and describe what that dynamic looked like. I, I mean, objectification is just dehumanizing. Uh, and I think that and I think that um, what all of the 16 women who gave their testimony for my book uh, describe is that, uh, you know, they weren't people to him. Um TM, who's the one um, testimony giver who wanted to remain anonymous, described feeling as though he, she was just a piece of ass who uh, who was there for him to hump her or to to give him pleasure um, in some way, and uh, and so the 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 assaults actually took place in plain view of everybody, uh, but under the auspices or 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 under the sort of the, the, the story that he was adjusting people, that he was helping students attain postures that they couldn't otherwise attain, or even more kind of um, deceptively, and I would say creepy, that his touch was conveying some kind of spiritual knowledge. And, and this really goes back to um, uh, a very old and sacred idea in, uh, in, in a part of Indian wisdom culture called tantrism, where um, the, the guru is said to embody a kind of bio-spiritual grace and that by his, usually it's a his, touch, uh, or their gaze, or, you know, they can, they can, they can strike you with a peacock feather, that there's a literal sort of, uh, a transmission of spiritual realization into the student's body. And that's a felt, you know, phenomenological experience. And, um, and, and part of the story that started to accrue around what Joyce was doing as he was sexually assaulting women and possibly men too. That's not, that's not verified by first person testimony though. But part of the story that started building up around him was that this is what he was doing was that he, he, he wasn't, he wasn't digitally raping that woman. He was helping her find her mulabanda, which is a, um, a term for like an internal muscular, but also esoteric sensation that, that is that is tied to the rise of kundalini or esoteric energy. So he was doing that, or he was helping her heal from sexual trauma. So, so this this whole, as Karen Rain says, this whole sort of slew of cryptic justifications arose around his behavior. And the weirdest part is, is that he didn't even he wasn't the source of them. It was the students who said these things about them. Uh, said these things about him. And, and I don't think I actually regret not making that clear in the mm -hmm. book. I don't, 
I don't say um, that he was the source of the explanations, but I also I don't think I'm explicit enough in saying that it's pretty likely that he wasn't. I don't think that anybody asked him directly, what are you doing when you grope these women's breasts or when you put your hands on their buttocks or when you put your fingers into their vaginas? Like, what are you doing? He didn't he wouldn't if when he was confronted about sexual assault, uh, the few times that that you know I have evidence of, uh, he was very embarrassed. Uh, he would burst into tears at one point, uh, and apparently he would stop from time to time. But like somebody who had uh, clearly an illness, he he wasn't able to stop for very long. Um, so, yeah, uh, the the objectification um, was a felt reality by the women who uh, he assaulted and. Um, yeah, it's and 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 I think we have to then wonder uh, what it means for his senior students and how they present asana or yoga practice to the world now. Like, what were the conditions under which they learned? Right. Because because if they were assaulted while they were learning, that's going to inform their bodily sense of you know who they are and 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 what this means and what they're what they're feeling and who they're doing it for. And if they were watching other people being assaulted, uh, what kind of secrets are their bodies holding? And, and, you know, as I said in the beginning, you know, these are some of the reasons why I really, I was scared to go into this material because, because it's, it's really deep. It, it suggests that at the heart of this, you know, venerable, lauded, beloved, you know, spiritual slash wellness practice, there's this really dark problem that, that hasn't been looked at and hasn't, and hasn't been addressed. Yeah. Major dark underbelly. Um, oh. as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm imagining the, uh, the, the listener that may not be familiar with the Mysore style of practice. So just right. to, to say that this is a style where unlike a t- typical lead class, like if someone were to go to a regular yoga studio or a gym and, and the teacher would sort of take them through a sequence, talking them through, maybe adjusting at times. But in the Mysore system, students show up quite early in the morning. Sometimes, I don't know what, sometimes early as 4, 4.30 yeah. a.m. And um, they, they're they not following a lead uh, series of instructions from the teacher. They're, they're following a, a series of postures that um, they've been given uh, right. in a successive stage, stage-like manner. Um, so you're, you're basically practicing independently and then the teacher comes around and adjusts you or assist, quote unquote, assists you. And right. that's, that's, it's that intimate contact, uh, of the adjustment or assist where, uh, this, this is the, the, the moment of, of, uh, abuse, uh, the, the, right. In Joyce's circumstance, it was, and, and it's, and that becomes really complicated because one of the things that, um, the, the Ashtanga world has, prided itself on for the last 30 years is the sense that the teacher is able to learn and know about the student intimately because they are having personal interactions with them multiple times per morning, every morning, six mornings per week, you know, two hours per session, uh, two days off per month. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I mean, that's where we get into the notion of whether or not, whether, or that's one of the ways in which we get into the notion of whether or not, uh, the, the method fosters communities that are actually high demand or cultic, right? Mm -hmm. Is, is how much time is actually occupied. But this feeling that people are getting individual attention and that when the teacher comes around and pays them that close attention, meanwhile, their colleagues are not supposed to be looking. They're supposed to be concentrating on their own stuff. They're supposed to be concentrating on their breath or there's even eye positions that people are supposed to take. There's this sense that you and the teacher are alone and and there are people who absolutely love and they thrive on that. And, and there's no reason they, sh- they shouldn't because it, it sounds like a, it sounds like a really good thing. And I, and I know that it works in practice, uh, in many circumstances, but it also sets up a very, very vulnerable situation in which people can be, people can be, uh, exploited in, in plain sight. And just to be really explicit about it, and you do, you document this in your book, but what are these? What were the adjustments that were abusive? Like, yeah, well, he would he would um, uh, grope women's genitals and breasts, and he would uh, he would climb on top of them and actually uh, thrust his genitals against their own genitals. 
Uh, he would uh, come behind women and uh, digitally rape them by actually pressing his fingers into their into their tights, through their tights, into their genitals. Um, and you know, it's it's almost it's almost incredible to 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 say, but you know, story after story, testimony after testimony, uh, this is what this is what we come up with, and it doesn't make sense for for 30 years of such activities to, um, to, to take place in plain sight without there being a network of complicity that's supporting and enabling them. And, and that's why I started to use the, the language of cult analysis to describe how it actually happened. Mm -hmm. And, and that network of complicity, and I want to explore that more. Um, it, it does, hit me on a personal level. I never really pursued Ashtanga yoga myself. I have lots of friends in the Ashtanga yoga world, right. uh, authorized teachers. Um, and I've taken a few classes here or there. Um, but when I first got into yoga, just to, just to put a sort of a context on this, when I first got into yoga and started hanging around in studios that had an Ashtanga yoga program, um, I did hear these whispers around uh, certain kinds of adjustments and, and the, the euphemism that was given for this kind of very intimate genital touch was called a mula bandha check. And right. mula, as you describe, mula bandha is sort of this energetic, muscular lock uh, down in the perineum and the teacher is coming around feeling that to make sure it's in quote unquote engaged. Right. And I'm, I'm appalled at myself in a way and you know, that, that I, I kind of joked along like, aha, like this is just a spiritual, the thing that we don't, I don't understand because I'm not far enough along to even, even perceive it myself or to see the value of it or see how uh, important it is when it's just bad shit. <laughs> right, right. But there's something plausible about it. Right. There's right. something, there's something plausible about it. And I, and I, I don't think I address this in the book either, except, except where I get into, um, the, uh, the fact that especially, uh, tantric and hatha yoga history is filled with, uh, analysis and, and thought and practice around the sublimation of sexual energies. And so, you know, I don't, you know, there, there's a, there's a way in which, there's a way in which people show up in spaces like this and they are working so, uh, extrovertedly with their bodies in very vulnerable positions. And they're told that, you know, this practice is, it will have kind of like a total effect upon their bodies, minds, emotional, emotions, psyches. Uh, why shouldn't their, sexuality somehow be included in that why shouldn't their the the intimacy of their you know their their deepest selves be somehow exposed and isn't that where so much strength lies i mean this these are all of the this is all the language that surrounds uh the sexuality of yoga that that um can i believe begin to soften a person up into not really going, wait a minute, what's more obvious here is that this guy is sexually assaulting women and that he's doing it for his own gratification and that, and that, um, you know, there's no therapeutic benefit to this. And, and, you know, you could meditate your way into believing that there was perhaps, but most people are not actually having that experience and, and we shouldn't be telling them that they should. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, I, I, I appreciate I appreciate the your 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 confession but I also want to say that you know the the notion that the notion that people should be liberated somehow in the way in which they conceive of their sexuality within yoga is part of yoga's appeal actually <laughs> and so and so it's not I don't think it's a big leap for people to go oh well uh, maybe I shouldn't be so uptight about about s such and such or maybe I shouldn't uh, ask too many questions or that's private after all but also we're working on our private stuff and so I think it's very very confusing and and um, you know, and and the the women uh, again. I'll, I'll refer to TM in the book, who says that um, you know, as soon as she was sexually assaulted, uh, 
somebody who saw it happen came up to her and said, okay, so you realize that what just happened to you, uh, that wasn't sexual, right? And she was very, she was confused. She was like, what do you mean it wasn't sexual? And, and they had some explanation about Shakti pot or like spiritual transmission. And, you know, it, she didn't give the impression in the interview that she totally bought off on the idea then, but she bought off it on en- she bought off on it enough to be confused and to be disarmed and to and to sort of be put in this position where she should she felt that she that her own critical thinking or her resistance to the idea was somehow problematic so um and that it was going to stand in the way of her spiritual development and, or something like that so so yeah, um, uh, it's not it's not a surprise that these things get uh, wrapped up to together and uh, and and sold on and end up uh, rationalizing abuse to me. Yeah. Now, I, in following you, I know that you have your eyes on many different yogic and Buddhist meditative spiritual communities that have lots of these bad yeah. dynamics at play. Um, what was it about the Ashtanga? situation itself that that made you want to put it in the forefront of your case study in the book um i i think i think it's really uh, a kind of awful serendipity really because it was reportable um the evidence was clear uh the the net, network of sources that i began to develop uh began to send me this cascade of information um and just the, let me interject for a sec the, uh, in terms of evidence being clear, because this sometimes comes up when I have conversations with people about it. The, they refer to the allegations. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and the thing that pe- listeners need to know is that there's ample video and, and right. photographic evidence documenting all of this. There's also 16 women who said he assaulted me and this is how he did it. Right. So so it's not I mean, one is enough. Uh, and, but, but, you know, there's no question anymore that there are, that, that we're in allegation territory. And, and that's a, that's a really, I think, um, crucial moment actually, because one of the things that, uh, that, that comes up in each one of these yoga or Buddhist community, uh, you know, spiritual, physical, emotional, sexual abuse cases is that, the behavior of the, of the the actual actions of the leader of the perpetrator are always interpretable. There's always something mysterious or like um, uh, or a little bit beyond or childlike or innocent or super spiritual that about the leader, about Mr. Joyce or about Munus Omanos or about um, Bikram Chowdhury, although less so, more more people would would under- see him clearly for who he is. Um, but there's always something mysterious about the the leader or the the guru, which is probably not a, a good word for these people, uh, that that allows their behaviors to be endlessly bandied about as though, well, we can't really know what he was doing, and you know, his his the relationship between the teacher and the student is sacred, and you know, we don't know what's going on, we can't really interpret. Uh, you bring up the video evidence; people argued about that for years. They're watching sexual assault taking place like before their own eyes and they're saying, oh, we don't know what's happening. We don't know what's going on. So it's been it's been a combination of forms of evidence that um, I think have moved it out of allegation territory. But more importantly, out of the territory of interpretation where the um, the the leader who is who has perpetrated crimes is somehow beyond the realm of the normal citizen who can be evaluated in the same you know according to the same standards of evidence as, as anybody else. Um, well, and there's something about that interpretability that is like essential to his magic, usually his magic that that you never know quite what he's doing, right? You never know. Um, you never know uh, uh, whether it's actually for your benefit or not. And, you know, even if he's abusing you, maybe he's helping you get over ego. There were people who would say that 
because the other thing that Joyce would do is that he would just steal money from students. Um, he would cut short their stays or he would, he would say that they owed him more money than they actually did, or he would make up exchange rates between the U S dollar and the rupee in his favor. Uh, and, and Pete, when that came up, that was well known as well. And when that came up, people would say, Oh, he's helping people with their money issues. You know, they're, they're, they're attached to money. So people are capable of all kinds of, of BS when it comes to the interpretability of, of the magical person. And that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about is what, what role does a sort of a, a, a kind of somewhat flaky, soft, or even t- uh, directly in, a direct interpretation of uh, ancient spiritual texts um, that that draws on particular metaphysics? How do like how do like the, the spiritual metaphysics factor in to this cocktail of of toxic group dynamic? It's I think. I have two feelings about this question. One is that it's it's hard to say uh, how um, pre-colonial, especially Indian wisdom tradition metaphysics, play any kind of role in this at all. Because I don't think I don't think global yoga practitioners have access really to those metaphysics. I don't think we know uh, the kinds of relationships that they're grounded in. I don't think that, uh, we have a clear idea of what the commitments, the social and economic and, um, relational commitments, uh, there, there are, or were, or were supposed to have existed between teachers and students that would, that might ground all of this stuff. I do know that, uh, whether whether they're accurate interpretations or not, there are all kinds of yogic or Buddhist or pseudo yogic or pseudo Buddhist ideas around, you know, emptiness, interpretability, uh, the play of lila, um, uh, karma, um, all kinds of of terms that are correctly or incorrectly used to describe. Or to or to or to rationalize things that we would rather not confront as being abusive. So um, you know, definitely uh, there are ways. And well, okay. So well, I'll give an example of of, uh, of a concept that kind of carries both of these histories. Um, I go into detail in the book uh, on a Sanskrit word that uh, is parampara. And now, parampara in pre-colonial terms. Uh, you know, and to, up till this point, even now in contemporary India, uh, means something very specific about how knowledge is transferred, especially spiritual knowledge in this context. It can apply to other forms of knowledge, knowledge as well. But it implies this unbroken, usually familial, certainly intimate relational transfer of knowledge that depends on a whole series of social commitments and contracts in order to keep it keep it stable. Now, Um, it also implies that the knowledge that's being transferred goes way back in history and has been tested by time. Well, modern yoga Ashtanga practitioners or Joyce method practitioners from America and Europe have started using the word parampara to describe what they belong to. And and so what that means is that they're saying that a, a technique that Joyce developed in the late 60s uh, and changed several times as his shala got busier, they're, they're implying that that is traditional in a way. Um, they're implying that it has the weight of several generations of validation behind it. They're implying that they belong to a heritage rather than, you know, uh, a branded family business. And so we have this, we have this beautiful word that carries an ancient heritage that and I don't know, like I, don't, I personally don't have access to how that actually works, but I know it's there and I know it, it, it I, I hope that it can be recovered in some way or it can be made more known, more well known, or I can have more access to it at least. And then we have this sort of like contemporary bastardized version of the term that's used to pretend that uh, the people who are the people who are using it have something you know, magical or special when, when that's really deceptive. Right. I mean, and the deceptive, the deception around it too, I mean, in, in the yoga landscape at large, at least in my experience, Ashtanga has held this kind of vaunted position as the legit 
hardcore, no nonsense, um, real, authentic practice. Right. Um, right. And I can't remember if you're in your yeah, book. Wait, a minute, though. Every every group does say that, though. Like every <laughs> like like the the, the, uh, the Iyengar the Iyengar fold will say that this is authentic. This is true. This is this is this is hardcore. It's hard to know. I mean, every group makes proprietary and, and sort of like advocacy claims, self advocacy claims. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to don't want to interrupt. You you you're, you're saying that. Yes, I would agree. Well, uh, and then there, there, in, uh, did you get into this in your book about the like Mark Singleton's work um, dr- drawing on looking at the origin of modern postural yoga, of which I, jo- Joyce's system comes is part of? Yes, yeah. So I, I I refer to it here and there throughout the book because you can't really avoid it. Singleton Singleton's work, um, I think, dated uh, to 2010, really blew the lid off of the notion that postural sequences or postures themselves or the way in which they're practiced in group class formats with adjustments that that any of that has any pre-modern heritage uh it's more like it's more like um indian anti-colonial activists in the 1920s and 30s uh wanted to indigenize physical culture influences from Europe, actually colonial influences, uh, gymnastics, uh, harmonial gymnastics, weightlifting, bodybuilding. They wanted to indigenize these physical culture practices uh, as forms of, you know, national uh, physical culture and uh, but also but also anti-colonial pride building. Uh, and it worked. It was really, really effective. Uh, but what we have is something that pretends to have a stronger linkage to the medieval history of Hatha yoga than it actually does. And then that's what gets exported to the world is the notion that, um, you know, Joyce's system is ancient or that it goes back to Patanjali or something like that when, when there's no evidence for that at all. But it becomes a very powerful selling and marketing point. Um, right. and, and, you know, it's, it's so common within the modern yoga world. And this is why I think Singleton's book was so riveting and so, um, outrageous to many people and also so, um, uh, earth shattering is that, is that, you know, he doesn't phrase it this way, but, but the research as he lays it out, uh, basically says, basically says what we have believed about the modern posture, about the modern yoga movement is mostly deceptive, um, is mostly, is mostly, um, uh, a kind of, a kind of clever elaboration or, 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 um, it's an invention. And, and, and it's an, it's an invention. And, and we have, and we have endowed it with a kind of orientalist, you know, I, idealistic, uh, mysticism, Um, And that has become one of its main selling points. It's also what has made it resistant to, you know, contemporary biomechanics and contemporary kinesiology and, and, you know, contemporary physical therapy. So, um, yeah, it's really it's really complicated. But but there's part of of the (laughs) here's another example. There's part of this this invocation of tradition that also shielded Patabi Joyce from scrutiny. Because one of the things that his students would say, and they say it to this day, actually, is that, you know, his adjustments, uh, as brutal as they were, as injurious and as intrusive as they were, were traditional. Well, they might have been traditional in the sense that that's what Krishnamacharya did to him, but we don't have any evidence that physical adjustments in yoga existed prior to the 1920s. Uh, and I, and I kind of, I prove that, I think, in my book by citing the work of, uh, several historians of medieval yoga who say, uh, or one in particular, Dr. Jason Birch, who, who says, no, there's, there's no evidence for anybody physically assisting anybody else in a yoga posture prior to the 20th century. Yeah. And just to, just to jump on that for a second, the, um, around the nature of the adjustments, because we've discussed how, uh, the, the, the component of sexual assault in them, but the physical assault too, of and the and the, and the, the stories of people just hearing ligaments snap or rip, right? I mean that was it was just sort of sending shivers down my spine as I read it, it the whole book in in a way. But um, right. that 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 is uh, just it's harrowing to to read. Yeah, and it also shows it shows how 
um, effective and immersive the propaganda was around Joyce's power that, that, um, you know, the senior students openly joke about how they all crawled crying out of practice every day. They all openly, uh, talk about how, um, you know, how, oh yeah, he blew out my knee and he was doing this, but I got the posture or he, or he led me towards a more advanced, you know, position in the series or something like that. The, the way in which, um, this group of people was enculturated to withstand pain is extraordinary. And I think it's had a huge ripple effect, uh, or, or kind of like a trickle down effect into the next generation with regard to, uh, how we regard the body and effort and pain in general. Um, you know, there are very few, I would imagine, in North America and Europe, yoga teachers who are cranking people uh, today the way that Joyce cranked people in his day. But um, uh, but I think that the, the, the basic ideas around what pain means, what injury means, what pushing yourself means, what being pushed by a teacher means, those have all remained intact mm-hmm. in many places. Yeah. So we, we've you've you've sort of discussed a little bit about the the spiritual interpretation and reframe of a lot of this behavior. What has right. been some of the the response you've received or seen in, in light of uh, the stuff coming out, and also in light of your book? Um, what, how is how is the community both within Ashtanga and outside the yoga community outside of Ashtanga uh, received this? It's it's really it's. It, there's a huge spectrum, and um, there's kind of a line in the sand, as it were, of that spectrum between um, people who um, identify as Ashtanga practitioners and people who don't. And amongst the people who do, if this is a really difficult book to read, and um, you know, some people have really negative reactions to it. Um, although, you know, it's not like the reactions that they've had to my more informal blog work over the years, which, you know, they've, which a lot of people have just been able to dismiss or to say, you know, it's agenda driven or something like that, or that, you know, you just, you just hate our community or something. Um, which actually, know, the, again, this is very personal for me. I have friends who I've tried talking about your work with both yeah. here and in Europe. And, and there has been this view that you're this opportunist, you're, you're swooping in on, on this thing just to, to elevate your own, work and your own your own profile and and i've just i've always gone cross-eyed when when that's come up I'm like, well, no, 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 this is not what he's doing um but i have to say it's opportunist, it's opportunist in the sense that that nobody was doing it for one thing and and i would say that anybody in the ashtanga world who calls me an opportunist should really ask themselves the question if you knew about this where was your book mm-hmm. where was your newspaper report where were why didn't you go to a journalist i mean it didn't have to be me why was it me why was it me it's like it's 2010, Annika Lucas published her story, published her account, and it got buried on Facebook. There was like five likes to it. Nobody shared it. You know, there's one comment saying, you know, this. a lot of people are going to say you're a very brave person sometime in the future. Fast forward six years later, she, she republishes her blog. By that point, I'm talking to Karen Rain for two years. Every People asked for like a decade, where did Karen Haberman go? Where did she disappear to? Like, you know, she got so far away from the Ashtanga scene and the yoga world in general, she changed her name. And it's like nobody wanted to ask a little bit further. Nobody wanted to go. Nobody wanted to take that, take that farther. So, I mean, okay, opportunistic. Yes. Uh, but that's because there is this great big vacuum. And with regard to, you know, my profile, well, we all have jobs and, and, you know, my job as strange as it is and as self-made as it is, is that I look at abuse in spiritual communities. And so, yeah, does it raise my profile? Yes. Does it win me fame and fortune? Um, no, <laughs> I mean, and anybody who thinks anybody who thinks that somehow I've gotten rich or or doesn't I mean, they just don't know anything about what writing a book means or what it means to sell it or or any anything about it. And and, you know, it's like 
did you did anybody say that that uh, that uh, that Rowan Farrow was opportunistic for reporting on Harvey Weinstein? I don't think so. They looked at the work and they said, "Wow, he gained the trust of you know what was it eight women who who he published on in that first New Yorker. Mm-hmm. He he gained the trust. He he was able to publish their testimonies. He pretty much stayed out of the way." Uh, and uh, he created a victim-centered uh, narrative, mm-hmm. and so. Uh, but you know, I didn't actually. You asked the question, and I didn't want to go on a rant about like. Well, well actually, you know, I just want to interject too: is that that the, the, the people that that I'm in contact with that had said that actually have read the book and have actually completely changed their tune. Oh, okay. So, the, oh, okay. so, so well, even with people that were initially critical, they've read the book and they feel that this is a very fair, balanced treatment and an important. Uh, that it's that it's out now and i hope i hope that i hope that slowly gets in i mean a part of i think i think part of that maybe the threshold has to do with you know um it's not like it's not like i was a professional journalist in sports or something like that and and you know i got wind of this story and and people didn't know who i was but you know, I've been writing as a cultural critic within the yoga world for the last five years. There's lots of people, or well, not the last five years, since you know my my book on Patanjali's uh, sutras was 2012, and um, you know there's, there's there's been a lot of divided opinion about the value of what I do ever since then. So, and then and then as a cultural critic, as I've reported on on various abuse stories, um, you know the Anusara um, implosion, the Jiva Mukti lawsuit, uh, the Satyananda Yoga thing, um, uh, abuse revelations, um, Shambhala, Shamb- Shambhala, right, Rigpa. Uh, as I've as I've done that work, I've made a lot of um, allies and I've made a lot of enemies, and so. Um, but all of that is all of that really is in the sort of like public, uh, very jousty sphere of of blog work and social media. A book is a different thing, you know, when it's fully fully uh, editorialized and and uh, fact checked, and you know, there's legal backing of publication behind it. You know, it's 380 pages long, and there's 380 footnotes or whatever, and and um, it's 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 well cooked, and so. It's. I think it's unfortunate that um, I, I already had a name coming into this particular uh, work uh, that I carried, um, you know, the baggage of past work with me. But at the same time, I don't think I would have gotten the book contract without that. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's 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 it just is what it is. I hate that phrase, but I <laughs> did nothing. There's nothing. There's 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 nothing to have been done about it. Um, yeah. And. Uh, I won't re- won't repeat it is what it is. But um, one of the things I really appreciated about the book was the level of analysis that you went into, sort of deconstructing the dynamics in these high demand groups, that that broadens the conversation or from just saying, oh well, the perpetrator was just a bad apple, like he was right. a, he was a bad man, and um, you know we can throw him out but keep keep this very valuable inte- integral integral pa- practice in, intact right or the opposite which i hear a lot too is okay well if these people like with karen rain like going back again and again and getting uh, continually assaulted what's going on in her psychology or someone's psychology like that that, right. that that keeps them there that that why aren't we talking about that more and you, right. you i know you you're excellent at sort of um eviscerating both of those <laughs> <laughs> those those views. right right so, yeah so, so on, on one hand yeah on one hand the bad apple argument is just is just doesn't work because nobody assaults you know um jubilee cook estimates that there's thirty thousand. her conservative estimate was that there's thirty thousand distinct episodes of abuse or, or assault uh that that um we could we could um just briefly uh, take Take me yeah. through the math on that because oh yeah so so Jubilee Cook is one of the women who gave testimony and she was one of one of the women who was there for eight months and so I'll talk about her in the second section as well in the second part of this answer um, and she was assaulted repeatedly but she said you know this happened to me in three different postures every single morning this is the number of mornings every morning that I was there in Mysore I saw 
three other women who who got assaulted in those three postures. So she starts to she starts to build you know numbers out of what she personally experienced and what she personally witnessed, and then she just counts up the years. She counts up the tours. Um, I think she uses. No, I don't think she uses my research to try to figure out uh, how many women he actually came into contact with when he's away from the Mysore Shala on world tour, you know, in California or New York or Boston or whatever, um, or Hawaii. Uh, and she comes up with a with a conservative estimate of 300 or sorry, 30,000 uh, individual sexual assaults over what's likely a 30 year period. So, um, that does not, that's not a bad apple. <laughs> that's a whole orchard. <laughs> that's like, that's like, um, that's a, that's a, that's a bad apple and a whole bunch of people saying, no, this is great. This is a great apple. This is a great apple. And, um, and similarly, you know, in, in a contemporary story, more contemporary story, what we're seeing with, uh, Munuso Manos right now, which um, is and Munuso for yeah. just for for reference, for who is he? He's he's probably uh, BKS Iyengar's most famous, most prominent, most senior student, and the one who most embodies his own teaching persona, uh, his own his you know BKS's gruffness, his you know his his shouting, his. Uh, his way of, of both electrifying and terrifying a room at the same time. Uh, and he has recently uh, had allegations, numerous allegations of sexual assault verified against him by an independent investigation that was uh, commissioned by the Iyengar Yoga uh, Association of the United States um, and, uh, or INOS. And so, so in that ongoing story, which is, which is still unfolding, uh, we have this sense administratively within INOS that, well, you know, he's been delisted, he's been decertified, and the Iyengar family has removed his right in light of these crimes, uh, which can't be prosecuted. They're all um, outside of the statute of limitations. Uh, but in light of these behaviors, uh, he's been prevented from using the Iyengar trademark in his teaching going forward. And that's it, right? Like, this is not a regulated profession. He can go on and teach whatever he wants. He can he can teach Manuso Manos Yoga uh, tomorrow and open up shop wherever, uh, maybe in Bali or something. Uh, and And, but the thing is, is that administratively we have this sense that well he's been he's been sort of uh, excised uh, somehow he's been amputated and you know we're all fine now well here's somebody who had such teacherly influence for such a long time and such administrative influence over the entire organization for such a long time now i would say what the organization has to do is say okay who actually trained under this guy and who would attribute their certification to him and who was tested by him because everybody involved in that is going to have to be, I think they're going to have to answer some questions about, well, what did you actually learn from him? Uh, here's somebody who is probably less of a yoga teacher than a sexual predator posing as a yoga teacher. What did you actually learn? Um, and and how can we help you learn some more or how can we help you mitigate this this um, educational stain, really? Um, so, yeah. And then on the other side of it, it's like anybody who asks, why did Karen Rain keep going back to get assaulted by Patabi Joyce every every year? Doesn't know anything about trauma, doesn't know anything about domestic violence, doesn't know anything about um, uh, a trauma bond, doesn't know anything about being gaslighted. Uh, they, they basically, the, that, that response, which is very common, and I would say, you know, not, it's, it's, it's so common it shouldn't be shameful. I just think people should be open to correcting it. Um, people who have that response really have to get educated in uh, what it means to uh, be in a toxic power dynamic that confuses your basic uh, capacity to feel as though you have agency. Yeah. I I bring I bring up the metaphor in the book that you know if you if you broke a person's leg uh, and and uh, there they were on the ground uh, you wouldn't 
you wouldn't blame them for not running away from you uh, as you came in to damage them further. Uh, but somehow with sexual assault, we, um, we look at the survivor, the victim or the survivor, and we say, why didn't you run away? When, when actually the, the, the sexual and the physical assault have deprived them in many cases of their capacity to feel as though they are autonomous, to feel as though they uh, can, can have, uh, you know, individual agency, to feel as though they have their own bodies even. Right. Well, that, that's a huge, hugely important piece that I think gets overlooked. Um, I know you're not fond of this guy, and I, I think I, I have mixed feelings about him myself, but I, I was glancing through Jordan, Jordan Peterson's book, and he makes some comment that I think is re- relevant here where he says, um, you know, if we deny a victim response, some responsibility, we deny them agency. Right. To some... Yeah, except that he's going to use that to say that 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 we somehow as observers of the victim have to give them responsibility within our assessment of what happened during a particular crime. Mm-hmm. Right. Like what well, he's not he's not speaking. He's it, it, the problem with that is that there might be some. There might be some some therapeutic application of that principle of, you know, well, you know, in this moment, do you feel as though you have agency with regard to how you're moving forward coming out of this experience that might happen privately in therapy later. But you but if but what happens is uh, and I can hear it in that quote is is that is that the, the notion of victim is turned into a kind of psychological state instead of, uh, uh, you know, a label for somebody t- against whom a crime has been commit- committed. It's like nobody, the, the prob- and the problem, the further problem with assigning responsibility, regardless of what that even means, like, what does that mean? Is, are you res- is it about the clothing? Is it about the fact that you went that morning? Is it about the fact that you, you know, your your voice froze when you wanted to say no like what what responsibility are we actually talking about and and can it survive can that discussion survive the fact that one of the reasons that Karen Rain was assaulted over and over again was because the group had deceived her about what was going on and it's like there is the problem that i don't think jordan peterson or any of his kind of like the the alt right bros want to really face is that you cannot be responsible for having been deceived. There's no, I mean, it's like I'd even say his own fans aren't responsible for him deceiving him, <laughs> him deceiving them. It's like you, you, it's very very difficult to protect yourself against being deceived. That's what deception is. It, it happens to it happens to intelligent people. It happens to mediocrely educated people. It happens to to people who aren't educated at all. Um, if you are if you are deceived about why you are in a place, about what it's going to offer you, uh, then you're you've really already had your agency taken away, uh, and it's not like you're going to give it. It's 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 been taken both places, both both cults that I was um, that I was uh, uh, recruited into. They presented themselves as other than what they actually were. No, there's no part of Ashtanga yoga that said to Karen Rain, hey, this is a cult in which you'll be uh, sexually assaulted every day. No, that's not what they said. They said. This practice will give you spiritual liberation, and if you follow this 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 teacher's instructions, you know as closely as you can, and you surrender your body up to them, your process will go a lot faster. Mm-hmm. That's what they said. That's what they said. And if and if she's to blame for believing that, well, you know, it's like let's 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 have another conversation about what people actually end up believing. Right. Yeah, it, I mean, I thought, I thought that part in the book was great. And you also, from, from there, you then expand into a uh, analysis of sort of structural systemic conditions that do kind of disorient and confuse and, and you create this kind of vertiginous internal phenomenology for the person right. that, that makes it very difficult to, to see, see one way or the other. 
Right, right. And I think, you know, I really have uh, the work of Alexandra Stein to thank for that because she uses this basic um, – so just a caveat here. When, when we talk about the psychology of the person who's victimized by a cult, it's not to say that, you know, there was something inside them that made them more vulnerable. The deception is the threshold. And then there are psychological pro- pro- processes that can take over that make recruitment easier, dependency easier, dread of leaving easier. Uh, but what she says is that, you know, the main thing that the cult does is it rewires your way of relating to people, to everyone really, towards the end of the attachment spectrum known as disorganized, where you're actually in a constant state of love and fear of approaching but withdrawing, of going to a person for love who you know on some level is also hurting you but you feel dependent upon. And one of the things that she says this creates is this this amazing uh, – I mean I say it's amazing. It's awful. But it's amazing to me because it, 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 it articulates my own cult experience so well. Uh, she describes a triple isolation in which – You know, you're isolated from the outside world. You're not, you're not, you know, you've lost your old friends probably, or you've written them off, or they're not enlightened enough for you, or you're just separated from them because you're in an ashram or something. Uh, And then you're isolated also from people within the group because there are certain things that are taboo to talk about. And in the Ashtanga world, you know, you couldn't say, uh, around the breakfast table at Mysore, he sexually assaulted me. Or if you tried to, you'd be told, oh, no, that's not what it was. And then that second layer of isolation leads to a kind of internal isolation from your own moral sense, where it's like, you know, you had values that helped you navigate the world. You had a compass that was a shining light for you. Um, but, but now it's kind of broken or it's been occluded and, and, you know, the wisdom of the group, the wisdom of the group has entered in and has kind of overwhelmed, uh, what, what, what you've been able to decide for yourself in terms of your moral values throughout your life. So that triple isolation is like this amazing, this amazing idea. You're, you're with other people, but you're totally all alone at the same time. Mm -hmm. And the only person who really is the reality principle is the leader, is Mr. Joyce, is Mr. Iyengar, is, you know, perhaps Manus Omanos. In my case, it was, in my case, it was Michael Roach at the Asian Classics Institute or Charles Anderson at, at Endeavor Academy. Like the guy, that guy was, was the reality principle. Right. They have all the answers. Right, right. And that's part of and that's part of what what you know, that's part of what what alienates you from your own even your will to to uh, propose an alternative or to ask questions, which, of course, you're not allowed to do. Right. Yeah. No, I, th- I thought the, the 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 inclusion of attachment theory there was was pretty helpful um, yeah. for, for just for shifting the, the kind of the blame on the victim and or the blame on the on the uh, on the, the leader. Too. Right, right. Yeah, it's it's a system. They're working together. I don't, you know, when it comes down to it, and I, I would like people to just reflect on the fact that, you know, you have no idea who Jim Jones was. You have no idea what was going on in, you know, Chogyam Trungpa's head. You have no idea what what the inner life of Vikram Chowdhury is. Like, the what is it called? The Eisenhower rule or... The, the, what psychiatrists came up with in the 1950s where they, they sort of self-imposed. They're starting to break it with Trump now. All right. But a lot of professional clinicians are like have this self-imposed rule that they're not going to diagnose people that they're not in clinical practice with. Um, but I think that's a really sound, sound principle is that you don't know what's, I don't know what's going on in Patabi Joyce's head. I, I don't know what his, his internal constellation is like. Uh, I don't, I, I've, I've spent two years interviewing Karen Rain. I feel like I know her a a lot better than I know him, but I still wouldn't presume to know why she, 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 she makes choices that she does that all of that intentionality, all of that speculation on people's internal states, it, you, what it usually does is it overshadows the fact that a crime has been committed and we can obviously set up ways of of preventing it from happening again. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I know we're, we're closing in on your time a bit and I do want to get into maybe the path ahead 
You know what? Right. Because you, I know you hold that intention in the book of of offering some sort of roadmap forward with better practices. Right. Um, what? So one of the things that, I, as a teacher myself, and I, I visit other, I, I do trainings in various yoga studios, and uh, one thing that's come up for me is that I still, I've had some studios on my on my schedule that still hold, have photographs of. Patabi Joyce in their their sort of altar corner of the studio, and there haven't been, uh, to my satisfaction, statements of distancing and denouncing and and separation and all that. And I have to say, I'm deeply gratitude, a lot of gratitude to you for your work because it's helped me sort through how to engage with that. And I, you know, and but one of the things that's come up for me in trying to talk about it with these hosts and these other studios is. Um, it's hard to escape a little bit the the idea of uh, or the dynamic of virtue signaling, where you kind of come off pious or sanctimonious. Like, look, you you know you have this and you have this photograph up, and it's you're silencing victims and doing it. You're part of an institutional enablement, and I think that's really all important to say. But it 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 actually hasn't gone very well for me with right. these, these places. That I I get labeled as being judgmental. Um, not understanding them and not letting them handle it in their own way. And um, so, you know, yeah, you know, you know, but you don't have to do that work because the survivors have done it for you, really. Like uh, Karen Rain and Jubilee Cook published this amazing, I hope this goes into the show notes, but this amazing essay on Yoga International that uh, the title is something like, What Do Survivors of Sexual Abuse in Yoga Communities Need? And it's it's like a white paper mm-hmm. that basically lays it out and says, look, here we are. We're two sexual assault survivors of a 20th century yoga master. And this is how this is what happened to us. And this is how we feel about what will create safety and respect, not only for us, but for students going forward. And, you know, I think anybody who reads through that and, you know, and there are stuff around, there's stuff around, you know, don't venerate, you know, people who are people who are uh, sexual assaulters or rapists. Um, that's not safe for the people who come to your studio. You know, you have to make a distinction between people that you love because you love them and people who are triggering to to uh, your students. I mean, that's just that's basic adulting for for one thing. But anyway, she, you know. Their their list of the things that you can do is all laid out for you, and I don't think you have to be worried about virtue signaling by referring to what survivors of sexual assault need. I mean, that's I mean, to me, virtue signaling is you know some sort of opportunistic uh, self-aggrandizement based upon associating yourself with with uh, you know a, a fashionable social cause but you're not getting anything out of those confrontations if you're trying to teach there so so i don't i don't think that you know i i, I don't and as far as like being judgmental goes um i mean well it's asking asking for basic justice and respect isn't isn't judgmental mm-hmm. um what's 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 judgmental or perhaps the better word is just inept is to continue to um, keep your head in the sand about what the person that you love did to people. You can still love him, but it doesn't mean that you have to, um, uh, you, you have to venerate him or, or, or say that he was somebody that he wasn't in public terms, you know, I think the whole notion of the veneration of the photograph is so difficult for so many people because there was an intensity with which he would gaze at them or or they would gaze at him. And often that would happen within the context of adjustments. And I believe that if if in some cases, if those portraits on those altars are are looked at from just the right angle, the person might go, oh, my God, actually. He's not who I thought I was, who he was after all. It's almost as if the, the portrait will stay on the altar to preserve something that, if it cracks, will crack the entire world along with it. And that's a tough place to be in. I would acknowledge it. But if you're running a public space uh, and and people who are sexual assault survivors are going to it and they can Google Patabi Joyce's name and, and you know the, that story is the first thing that comes up, how are they going to feel safe? How, and how are you? How are they going to feel as though you're not 
you know, somehow excusing or aiding and abetting or minimizing or or just not caring about sexual assault. That doesn't make sense. Right. You yeah. know, if, if, and if one in four women are have have are survivors of sexual assault and it's probably higher than that, do you really want to you know, like almost emotionally haze or gaslight a quarter of your potential practice population? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean. I mean, my, my main point is that is that you don't have to do that work because it's already been done for you in, in Rain and Cook's essay. And so that's really cool. I, that came across my desk a, a little while ago, and I, I did I did pre- very much appreciate that. And it, well, it's more I feel like if I'm going to these places, like I'm, I'm coming in not as a, a regular teacher, I'm coming in for a workshop or a training. Right. Um, I feel like if I'm going to a, a place that still venerates a, a Joyce type figure that in some ways my, my showing up is, is complicit with this, this network of complicity. Yeah. It's, it's hard. It's a hard, that's a hard one, right? I mean, I mean, it's, you, you'd have to make some personal choices around whether, whether you're using that, that privilege, the, the, you know, the, the, the fees that you're getting from the training to, you know, push back against that idealization. Um, yeah, that's going to be, there's going to be a lot of calculations in there. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's people who are at, at certain points in their, you know, career where they can say, well, I'm not going to work with so-and-so anymore and they can make that public and that will be very, very effective. Uh, and they won't hurt because of it financially. But, you know, I think people who, um, are, are, in different financial circumstances might find it more effective to uh, preserve the relationship with their Ashtanga Yoga Shala hosts uh, than to sever it all together and to, and to slowly encourage them to change. So, you know, those are really, those are individual choices for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, within Ashtanga world in general, what reforms do you, movements do you see happening and what, what gives you a sense of hope? Looking um, forward? You know, it, the the reform so far has been strong in some areas in the zone of sentiment uh, rather than action, but that's going to take a long time. It's not like it won't. It's not not going to happen. I'm sure. I'm sure things will improve. But um, you know, when you ask me that question, I think of. Uh, an amazing accountability statement made by Sarai Harvey Monk, who was uh, authorized by Sharath Joyce um, sometime in the 2010s, something like that. And, you know, she laid out this five point, you know, this is how my participation in this organization is, you know, is complicit with this abuse history. And here are the five things that I'm going to do now in my classes to make sure that I, I don't carry any of those impacts on. Um, there have been a couple of other statements like that, but hers is a real standout. Um, there is, uh, there's a guy named, a uh, guy, Donna Hay, who actually was the co-editor, uh, with Eddie Stern of a very, uh, popular book in 2012 called Guruji, which, uh, I describe in my book and I criticize it very, very closely and, and heavily as being a hagiography hey of Joyce that was published with the cultural knowledge of what was being left out. So um, he, Guy, is the co-editor. Eddie Stern is the other editor. But Guy has gone on kind of like this solo uh, truth and reconciliation tear on his blog. And he's published a lot of really beautiful pieces about that are basically what the heck were we doing? What did we overlook? Who did we not listen to? What does Karen Rain have to say? How can I make this up to her? Like he's doing an amazing amount of public, vulnerable um, uh, accountability work. And uh, he recently also uh, sponsored a petition uh, that's on Facebook trying to get Ashtanga certified and authorized teachers uh, to um, uh, make accountability statements. That's moving kind of slowly uh, because I think there's a lot of fear around uh, the control that the family still has over the the finances and the copyrights and or, not the, or at least the at least the 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 ability to practice uh, or to teach the the, the method, uh, quote unquote, legally or with the validation of of the family. So um, that's 
that's moving that's moving slowly and then on the logistic or the sort of material front there is a group uh, that's in formation and i think it's called the amayu collective and two of its leads are scott johnson from london in the uk uh and then greg nardi from orlando or fort lauderdale florida and um they're uh coordinating with uh a few other second generation ashtanga teachers um and uh so it's a young group i think about five uh and one of them isn't a teacher i think her name is emma she's actually a she's a she's a i think she's a women's studies professor in southern england somewhere and she's a student and and i think she's also an educational specialist uh and i think this group of five people are putting together a kind of alternative training program to what's on offer through sharaf joyce and kpj ayi so um i don't think that has really gotten off the ground yet there's a lot of aspirations involved there uh i know that the group will have some challenges with diversity with inclusion and also um you know i i would say that they probably have to make sure do a better job of making sure that they're professionally cult um um sorry professionally consulting with survivors like Karen Rain and Annika Lucas and Jubilee Cook uh because I think that's essential like a reform movement any reform movement that isn't asking uh Joyce's survivors exactly what to do and exactly what they need and exactly what they would have needed to keep safe is not really a reform movement at all mm-hmm. and in yoga in large i know yoga's kind of like the wild wild west of of uh, industries right. what kind of reform i mean i know you mentioned things like in more more of a consent culture in terms of adjustments and right. scope of practice uh, considerations what right. around that what would you like to see see moving forward well uh, the last part of my book um is is a is a is written as a workbook for the yoga teacher training industry and um it summarizes the analysis of the Joyce event and and the cult literature that i use um and i try to lay out a number of tools that i think i'm not an expert in this but i think will be helpful as teachers students and administrators and yoga service providers and yoga academics as well go forward in figuring out how to identify toxic group dynamics so um there's tools in there uh in in and the and the tools are accompanied by uh like personal essay questions for review um so there's something in there called the prism method there's eight best practices for um for avoiding cultic dynamics um there is also as you mentioned a scope of practice for the yoga humanities that i think uh would be a good idea and it's something that yoga alliance may um uh adopt in part not because i wrote it or anything but because it's in the air now they're doing a, a renovation of their standards after 19 years um and scope of practice or defining a scope of practice for a yoga teacher is uh, a keystone of that effort and that's super important because uh one of the reasons that joyce was allowed to be who he was is that nobody gave him any limits uh and you know he was given kind of free reign to pontificate about every aspect of a person's life you know so it's not just that he was teaching people asana that he was also telling them to stop taking their medication or he was telling them that their backs their back didn't need surgery or you know he was giving them spiritual advice perhaps or or what have you so um nobody it's it's like the modern yoga movement has been built on the charismatic personalities that did not have a scope of practice because it was thought or they assumed they could do anything and that is about to get um checked yeah there's a uh, rude awakening coming and that's a, and that's a really and that's a really good thing like if you've trained as an asana teacher let's stay in our lane uh let's not give dietary advice let's not pretend you're a marriage counselor let's not start talking about the chakras you know let's not or whatever uh let right let's not let's not um give psychological advice or talk about people's medications um and um and also let's not let's not bs about history and philosophy either uh because um you know it's 
it's becoming increasingly clear, and, and I want to cite my, my colleague Theo Wildcroft for coming up with this analogy. It's becoming increasingly clear that, um, you know, yoga teachers are not physiotherapists. They're not going to be trained to take care of your subluxated disc in your back. They're not going to be trained to fix your labral tear. Um, now, that's new, but people are becoming more aware of that. What what the public is less aware of is that it's fairly easy for your run-of-the-mill yoga teacher to manipulate a whole class of people intellectually and then psychologically by claiming that they know more about yoga philosophy than they actually do. So, um, so, so one of these tools that I offer in the sixth part is you know, are you really clear as a yoga teacher about what the limits of your humanities knowledge is? Are you, or are you giving people the impression uh, that you know what yoga philosophy says when actually very few people know what or understand uh, the, the the depth and breadth of yoga philosophy? So, so I hope those I hope those are I hope those are helpful ideas, uh, and I hope that and I hope that people are able to begin to look at the communities that they live in a little bit more critically, look at the kind of leadership that they have a little bit more critically, uh, and then start modeling that critical thinking. Yes. No, I think it's some great great direction forward. I'm getting drowned out, I think. I don't know if you can hear. I'm getting drowned out by weed, weed blowers and lawnmowers, right. unfortunately. Right, right. But um, look, it's been great. I've really enjoyed talking to you, and I'm really super appreciative of the work you're doing. I know it's Thank it's you. tough sledding. I see you. I follow you also in the comment threads, and you're, right. you're you've rolled up your sleeves. The, the knuckles are out, and it's a bit of right. a knife fight in there. But you're fighting the good fight, and uh, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you, Josh. It's a pleasure to talk with yeah. you. Great questions. Yeah. Thank you. Great, to, great to chat.